Uh, I'm Adam Hirsch, uh, the CEO of Notchable, and uh, I'd just like to, my two guests introduce themselves and we'll kick it off. Um, I'm Rob Key, I'm the CEO of Conversion. I'm Michael Sissons, I'm the uh, CEO of Syncaps. Awesome. All right, guys. So uh, we're going to do uh, two quick presentations, uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, questions for myself, and uh, hopefully get you guys uh, interested enough to ask your own questions. And this will be the last session. So stick around. It'll be uh, quite fun and hopefully uh, some new information. And we'll drive out some uh, key uh, pieces of uh, data and information that we were uh, kind of looking for for this conference as well. Um, so we'll kick it off with uh, Rob. And uh, there you go. Start it off. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. I know we're the last one for the day. Should I stand up? Yeah, yeah that's all right. Fine. Means. That's all right. Um, <laughs> so in any event, we, uh, Michael did suggest we were going to try to get a beer in here, but it was going to be a little complicated for the last one. So uh, bear with us. And if you see us at the bar, we will buy you a drink at a certain point. We have a cap, though, I think, at a certain point, right? <laughs> yeah, safe home. It is and an open bar, so we're yeah. just out here. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so real quickly, um, Conversion, for those of you who don't know us, we're actually 10 years old this year. And so, you know, Shell Israel has called us the first pure play social media agency, but we didn't even use the term social media until 2003-ish. Um, we're, we're a funny animal, um, and we're a funny animal in that we are part technology company, part management consultancy, and part agency. And so people aren't quite sure what to, what to call us at some point, but in the social listening or social space, we were pleased that we were called the category, uh, category leader along with Radiant 6 and Nielsen in uh, social listening in the Forrester Wave in the fall. Um, our model is to help big brands harness the value of social to become social organizations, right? And to do that, you do need technology and you do need to be able to do business transformation. So our model is, we're 10 years into it, and oh my goodness, that was his heart. Very loudly. <laughs> that's my heart. Um, they, uh, we're 10 years into it, and the truth is, um, you know, the, the, the conversations about social, in our view, in many ways, is still at a pretty immature level. So we'll often say, look, it's not about, and I don't matter, we, you know, there's a lot of this checklist stuff still going in here. We're doing our Facebook, we're doing our Twitter, et cetera. But it's, enough of that is what we say. It's about the enterprise. And what we actually mean is the power of this social thing that we're talking about is changing businesses. It's changing the way humans organize. It's, the, it's changing the way businesses go to market. And we're at the very front end of how profound this is going to be. We're, 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 so we want to go beyond tactics. This is actually an example of a global financial services firm who was a client who someone, well, they were tasked to say, who are the people in the organization that need to be involved in this social thing? And you can see where it cuts across the organization. It's everyone from enterprise technology and delivery to business leads from marketing and communications and PR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This stuff is complicated. And it's hard to do in a silo. Because from our view, uh, this social thing 10 years later, it's not about this paid, earned, uh, owned model, which to me is kind of like talking to a, a, pastry, a pastry chef saying, I'm in the, the egg flour uh, business. People just want the souffle. And the truth is, the models, from our point of view, need to be built around the way humans communicate. So it's really about how do humans communicate? They listen first, they figure out what's going to be said, they, see, they say it, they see what the impact is, and do it all over again. So we're seeing next generation organizations, instead of being built around the pay, public relations and advertising and the separation, this false delineation between paid and earned, is really built around the way humans communicate. Um, that leads to an interesting area because it becomes about the evolution of, of organizations. So as human evolution, uh, the, human, the evolution of human communications evolves, that we, organizations as aggregations of people are then obviously evolving too. And what we've seen in the market over the last several years is you know, this kind of the beginning of this, this maturity cycle is around this ad hoc experimentations where people are doing things at the fringe of the organization, usually because somebody loves it somewhere. Um, at some point, somebody in the organization says, you know, um, I want to be the leader in this particular area. It's going to be a business unit or it's going to be a product area. And we call those stovepipe imp implementations or there's a sponsor and you know, we're moving forward. And we're going to show you how we're going to be the leaders in the organization to make this happen. At a certain point, the other heads of the businesses and the product say, well, wait a second. I, why are you doing all this? I want to be involved in this as well. So we're going to do our own thing. So you end up with stuff everywhere. You have different analytics, you have different solutions, you have different training, you have no consistent way that you're doing anything. And it reminds me very much of what the web looked like in 1998, 1999, where every business unit had a different website, you had servers sitting under desktops because you could do that back then. There was no consistency, there was no systematic approach to social. We are now at the point in social, 10 years on, 
where the, the, the largest organizations, and the, we're, we're happy to be able to work with companies like 3M and IBM and others, have created systematic approaches to do social so we can scale this across the organization. And to do so, you need processes, and you need approaches, and you need frameworks to be able to make that work. From our standpoint, it starts with the listening part. Just like humans are listening first, it's about the social intelligence piece. And so, not to get into the, the, my, the minutia of this slide, but it simply says that the future of this social listening is evolving away from this real-time monitoring. Just tell me what people are saying about me right now to deep levels of intelligence that um, are going to fulfill all those different use cases within an organization. So it's not just crisis communications and PR, but it's also about product development and research and development, et cetera. And as you go up the pyramid, the, the frontiers of the technology are really around um, using things like natural language processing and machine learning to try to help machines understand what humans say. The truth is, the best sentiment analysis technologies are about 60% accurate, and that's for what they can find, because human, technology, human language is so complicated and evolving all the time that it's, it's very difficult. In fact, there are a thousand words added each day to the Urban Dictionary. So how do machines understand slang and sarcasm and all of these other things? But as you go further up the pyramid, it becomes the great frontiers, and I know this is an area that resonates deeply with Adam's heart, is about the, the, the social analytics. So how do we start to see what people are doing? What are they doing downstream? And how do you integrate all that web analytics data? Then how do you start to integrate that data with your internal customer profile data? So we can say, not only is this person speaking negatively in Twitter over here about this particular topic, X, Y, and Z, but they've been a customer since 2004. So we're at the front end of this, and uh, this, this confluence of big data, as Forbes magazine has said, this confluence of big data, analytics, and sentiment analysis is where the next Google-like type companies will, will come from. But the problem is, once you have all this data internally at these organizations, so you have all this intelligence flowing through the, the arteries of these organizations, many companies come to the point and say, you know what, this is interesting, but I can't do anything about it because we don't have the processes and the governance and the workflow and the enablements to be able to take action on this stuff. So if you're doing this real-time social intelligence, but you have no framework, you're not agile enough to be able to move on this stuff, then you're kind of wasting time. So what we're seeing in this space is the management consultants moving into this space pretty, pretty uh, aggressively. So you have McKinsey, who's partnered with Nielsen, and you have Bain and Deloitte and Accenture and all these others. We actually have built a management consulting practice to help companies being enabled around the governance issues. So it's the policy and compliance and management and the analytics, the execution. So it's the listening and the insight generation and the campaign management and those enablements that companies need to have themselves to be able to act on this stuff. They need to have consistent training. They need to be able to build the internal infrastructure so that they can actually act on this stuff. Um, this is change management. This is, uh, this is, a, this is about Social becoming the impetus for business redesign. And this is the reason why the consultants are putting such effort into this as well. But to do so, because we're 10 years in, we can say that we don't have to start from scratch. Um, we now have best practices that have been built over 10 years, so stand on the shoulders of giants. You can, you can know if you're 62% positive sentiment around X, Y, and Z, if that's good for your industry or not. You can understand across all these elements that you need to be enabled as a business, whether you're a leader or a laggard, and you look at the leaders and you could benchmark yourself and build processes to become leaders. The other thing that social, from my point of view, is about is it's wonderful that we do this listening and these arteries of information and this redesign, but what do you lay on top of it? And I think the age of campaigns is, in many ways, is going to become a relic. It's about the reinvigoration of meaning back into who we are, and I came from WPP, I came from the advertising industry. Our model is about its social purpose. If I can touch people at a deeper level of meaning, then they will do something for me, which are social movements, which then I will drive them towards an outcome, which are, which are social outcomes. Social, social purpose leads to social movements, leads to social outcomes. I find it very reinvigorating that we now have to do things that people care about that it's not about, about product and price and couponing, et cetera, as well, too. So it's all those things, the business transformation, the social intelligence, the social purpose, et cetera, but here's the problem. The term social media itself has become stunting, in my view. This is a word cloud of the actual conversation online about the term social media, and if you look at it, it's, it's content and business and sites and web and internet and company and tools and video. None of those words that we talked about 
business transformation, social intelligence, where is it? Because the maturity of the conversation is still immature, and I think we as an industry need to elevate this to be able to talk at a level within CMOs and the C-suite and others that show this as business transformation. So there's an old uh, Zen saying. This is the twice I've given Zen sayings today. Uh, ben Parr I gave one to earlier, which is the saying was, if you see Buddha on the road, kill him. Simply meaning that if don't get caught up with the messenger, you know, get to the message. And I think in this particular case, I transition it to say, if you see the word social media in the middle of the road, kill it. Because as a, as a, as a, uh, a person from the digital side or the large brand said to me the other day, as soon as I bring up the term social media in a brand the, with my CMO, the wallet snaps shut. So I think that if we begin to delineate if we begin to start to connect this social media thing to business outcomes and KP KPIs, key performance indicators that the C-suite cares about, we will get the attention and the resources and the movement within the organization to do that we all know, that we, what, the power that we all know is in, intrinsic within what we do. So thank you very much. Uh, quick awesome. things. Thank you. Awesome. Is the green button forward? Yeah, yeah it is. It's a big choice from the red button and the green button. <laughs> Go ahead, you got uh, one more slide, and go ahead. Great. Thank you guys very much for um, staying here. And that's the last presentation of the day. Good news, it is officially raining outside, so it's not sunny. Um, <laughs> you're not missing a lot. Um, so thank Until you. Until we're done. Until, Until we're, we're done, done and then it's going to be beautifully sunny for the remainder of the day. Um, again, I'm Michael Sissons. I'm the president and CEO of Syncaps. Um, rather than talking a lot about myself, I want to talk about some of the things that I've heard from numerous people in the audience today during the conversations in our time in Disney World um, over the last few days. You know, social media is something that everyone in this room, I think, has gotten into for a different reason. One of the things that I was considering and trying to figure out what to talk today was a few factors. One, it was Orlando, it was going to be nice. Two, it was the last presentation of the day. And three, <laughs> I was going to have to talk about something that was interesting for people to pay attention. The good news is um, it's raining outside, so there's <laughs> lots of people here. Um, one of the really pressing things that I've heard uh, numerous people talk about over the last few days is their frustration. Their frustration in their job, their frustration for being able to get things done, their frustration for their IT department of not understanding what social is, their frustration of their marketing department because their PR department doesn't understand, and a kind of mass confusion in terms of roles and responsibilities and how to get things done. There's not enough money, there's not enough time, and there's not enough people. How many of you woke up six years ago and said, I'm going to sign up and I'm going to join and become part of a social media team? Who is part of a social media team today? Who's part of IT today? Who's part of marketing today? Who works at an agency today? Who's just here because it's Orlando and it's Disney World? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my social media story started and had nothing to do with the internet. I worked for a subsidiary of Interpublic five years ago. I was standing on Toronto Island. It was a beautiful sunny day. I got a random call from New York, part of the, from Interpublic, saying, hey, we've acquired these rights to this thing called Facebook. Um, part of the deal is we get to represent Facebook in Canada and sell ad inventory. Do you want to come and do this? Uh, my response was, absolutely not. What is Facebook? Um, I'm out here, I'm hanging out with the killers, I'm on Toronto Island. This is way more exciting than this thing called Facebook. Okay? Two weeks later, got another call. Are you sure you don't want to do this thing? There's 200,000 college students on it. It's going to be really popular. No, it's not. It's, you know, it's not going to work out. Um, I got the third call. This time it was Canada, so it was cold, and it was raining. And it was an opportunity to come into an office. So I said, sure, I would love, love to do that. Um, and what that experience at IPG led to was getting to work with every media agency, every creative agency, every PR team, every marketing team. And what I experienced was enterprise confusion as well as stakeholder confusion within the agencies because it was, I'm, you know, I'm responsible for Brand X. I'm at the media agency. We run their social media. Hey, I'm at their PR agency. We run their social media. Hey, I'm at their digital agency. We run their social media. You know, the frustrated sales team is like, I do not know who is in charge. Can someone just please tell me who has a check that we can talk to because everybody wants to talk about this. Everyone says they're in charge, but we ultimately have no idea who is. Um, so three years ago, I decided to leave. Part of the reason was Facebook was opening in Canada. Um, and part of it was I was so frustrated from having those conversations day after day after day. 
I decided it would be a good idea to start a company that was focused around it for some reason at the time. <laughs> um, still have those conversations today. Um, and what it, what, what it ultimately came down to for me was I felt that there was an opportunity to create an organization centered in technology that helped customers be successful. And what I ended up forming was a company called Syncaps. Those of you may know what we are. Um, some of you may think we're a research company. Some of you may think that we're a Facebook page management platform. Some of you may think that we're an agency. Depends on which Twitter post you happen to have read. Um, even Adam was like, what exactly do you guys do? Um, we're, we're a full service social media technology company. We have a platform that helps large companies build, manage, and measure their social media, starting with their Facebook page, all the way through the management, the compliance, all the conversations, all the way up into the measurement and ROI. This is not the be all and end all of the chart, but generally speaking, we've seen a lot of arrows are always heading in the upward direction. They're always going to the top right. Um, this is where the market started. It was we were listening to our customers, great, and then people got very confused between listening and measurement. We're, listen we're officially measuring. I had a customer said we're effectively measuring sentiment. It's all about positive conversations. It's all about tone. We're going to drive positive conversations. He went and told the CEO this. They then had some issues. The sentiment went down. The CEO goes, can you please influence the conversation? Hey, I can't do it. It's the product. Um, then it goes down into building a single Facebook page and then launching multiple blogs and building a social media strategy, then compliance. You're talking about a large collection of the organization. If there is often very few people in this room who are responsible and accountable for doing this entire chart. So what it ultimately comes down to is figuring out within your existing structure what it's going to take to be successful. And what we've seen is numerous things work. It really depends on the culture of your company and what you're looking to do. So is social media a dirty word in the enterprise? My experience has been it's not. A lot of organizations need to create a social media task force. Why? Because if they don't, they'll never get anything done. Now, they sometimes have to give those people money and power, but you know, that's a, that's just a, that's a side effect. So this is a, a very short version of a larger presentation that I often do that talks about an organizational current um, that I, I did watch in Inconvenient Truth. So if there's any similarities, it's not, a, it's not, really, it's not really a uh, coincidence. It is, I did see the movie. Um, <laughs> about how we started and, and ultimately how, what, it, how, what it takes and how we think about scaling social media marketing for the enterprise. This is the world, okay? Um, and when this all started, very few of us were actually thinking about the world. We were thinking about, we've got to integrate in a campaign, we've got to build a Facebook page. Holy, how do we build a Facebook page? It's so complicated. And often what we saw happen was one stakeholder would be kind of set up, take, take charge of it and become responsible. What ended up happening over time is different stakeholders throughout the enterprise ultimately caught wind of what was going on. They all became responsible for various pieces of social media, whether it was creating really engaging content, whether it was responsible for technology, and they were all part of this social media team that was disconnected. So what that ended up building was currents through the <coughs> enterprise. There were different powers, there were different centers of power, whether it was a business unit or a function. These people were not working together, and in most cases today, they're still not working together. And that comes down to the stories I've heard over the last few days, people saying, I'm really frustrated I can't get anything done. I'm really frustrated I can't get any budget. You know, I'm only working my one piece. And that's all driving the traction in a different direction. So what does that mean? It means that different social networks, you've got a Facebook page strategy using one platform for Facebook. You're using another platform for Twitter. You're using another platform for YouTube or RenRen or WordPress or LinkedIn. And what you end up with is, one, mass confusion, and two, a customer who is getting attacked from numerous job functions across the entire enterprise, um, which, again, is sometimes the way you need to go to get things done. But from an organizational current perspective, this isn't scalable, and this is going to lead to a pretty fragmented customer experience across the organization. The good news of how we think about it and where we're going, and this is really where our organization focuses and thinks, is how do we enable multiple stakeholders to connect to these different social platforms in one single piece of technology? And you know, there's a lot of stories out there. There's a lot of different 
technologies who have various levels of strength. You can read the latest Forrester report on uh, social media management platforms. Everybody has, has different strengths in different areas. One of the things that we think is really important is operationalizing and thinking about aligning it to what the organization's going to need over the longer term. So being able to have a single platform to connect across the various stakeholders and groups ultimately gets the stakeholders acting in a single way and being able to see all the actions related to a single customer in one view. An example that I'll use relatively quickly, because I'm talk too much, is, sorry guys, is um, BlackBerry. It's an organization we've been working with globally for three years. When it all started with BlackBerry, there was one person in Waterloo, Ontario, who was responsible for connecting with customers. Today, there's a very large organization that spans all across North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, who is managing these customer connections. They access a single platform across multiple agencies to manage these connections to the platform. And what you ultimately end up with is a social media marketing network that builds, manages, and measures relationships with customers. Today, in the case of BlackBerry, over 15 million across a large number of stakeholders, a large number of agencies, and a very large geographic. If every one of these stakeholders had taken a segmented approach or were using different platforms for different platforms, um, or were using just focusing on their specific area, you would never be able to build to the kind of scale that's going to be required for a large global organization to connect with their customers in a meaningful way. So without that, we should uh, begin yeah. the, the question and answer portion yeah, yeah, of the uh, day. All right. All right. Thank you, Rob and Michael. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of different topics we could talk about. Uh, personally, I'm always interested in this mass uh, kind of social data. There's a lot of it out there, whether from internal, external, whatever you're doing, blogs, Twitter, Facebook. Um, Mashable just launched uh, Mashable Follow a couple weeks ago. So now we have this whole other data set on top of Facebook and Twitter. And uh, we're, we're trying to make sense of it. So I mean, what I'm really wondering these days is because I'm looking at all the tools out there and I'm looking at all the things out there is what exactly uh, can we tell from this data right now? What are the great sources of data out there that we can actually pair it with? So obviously we have our data you know, coming in from the Twitter fire hose and the, and the Facebook little public things that we can get out of those pieces and the blog data. But what, I, what kind of information are we getting that's not you know, your normal page views, impressions, and uh, you know, how can we really start looking into who our audience is? You know, the, the beyond just the male, female, and you know, the age range, um, how can we really start uh, getting ideas and numbers from these people? And what are you guys starting to see on those trends? Um, Rob? Yeah. Well, it, well, conversely, we're mining about 250 million conversations in real time a day. Across and where? Across, well, Twitter, we're Twitter Firehose partner, uh, Facebook, where the public data is available. So right. we're, but we have to be very careful. We're doing public conversation areas. We can mine private venues, but right. as a member of the task force that have tried to work on ethics in this area, that you know, we have to really make sure that we separate that out a little bit. And the reality is, is this stuff is pumping in real time through the system, and, and blogs, and news groups, and forums, and everything else, by the way, and in multiple languages. Um, we actually have a partnership in Shanghai where we're actually doing Mandarin and pulling it into the system too. So, you know, what, what the problem, the challenge is, if you're sitting there and you're sitting at the, and you're being awash in this data, you're lost. And so, what the big challenge that the companies have to do is, you know, what do we want to know? Articulate the business questions that keep you up at night, and then configure the data to be able to answer those questions. Because I think what's happened before, previously, with a lot of these companies who have done this listening thing, they do it in the abstract, and then they have all this data, and they're saying, well, what do we do with this? So, but the types of business questions you can, you can ask the data are, are immense. Um, you know, P&G says 50% of its innovation is coming from outside the company through forms of social listening. They have that incentive. So it's like, what, are, what, do, what would people like to see? What are unmet needs in the marketplace? What are improvements to our particular products? What is it about our customer service issues that people are complaining about. And now the solution, the answers are start to, well, the questions come through social media. The answers can't always be, be driven through social media. You can't fix everything by just saying, hey, I'm sorry you had a terrible customer ser service experience. You gotta go into the bowels of the company and change the way that you're dealing with customer call data, the way you're, the way you're segmenting data, the way you're, you're doing your systems integration. Um, so I'd say social can raise a lot of the questions, and you can kind of get find some intelligence, but then you have to do the business transformation to be able to actually act on 
that data. And, and, and is there, uh, I assume, uh, I have never been inside both of your systems. To me, right. this is a, a, a mystery world of enterprise data. Mashable is obviously a small business. Um, not even gonna ask you guys how much it costs. And really, what, 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 what I'm wondering, though, is when you started getting into this data. We'll give it to you for free. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, we sure to disclose that. <laughs> um, when we started getting into this data then, like for instance, uh, if there is a customer service problem, at what point of level of noise, uh, which is you know, just the general data out there, do you actually start figuring it out? And then how far down into that data can you really drive? Is it, is it, obviously we can get location, that's an easy one we can usually get these days, we, and we can get the male, female, we can get the age ranges, but how far down can you dive into that data to really determine if it's a problem across the board, if it's one customer service representative specifically that we can now find a target? What have you seen there? Well, I think that you can, it, it, the, the challenge right now is, frankly, we're at the front end of this. So that the, 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 the data, the systems integration, e even with the Salesforce uh, acquisition of you know, one of our competitors, Radiant 6, you know, systems aren't integrated yet that you can actually take that conversation piece of data and then tie it, in many cases, all the way through to the enterprise and to you know, your, your databases. So that big systems integration piece is yet to happen. So a lot of this stuff at this point, the social data is actually still sitting a little bit in isolation. So you're pulling your web analytics data. But over the next two or three years, we see companies like AT&T and others who are really making great progress in terms of being able to uh, wire all this stuff together. But we're at the front end of all of this. And um, so- One last question yeah, then. Sure. What does the front ends really mean? I mean, just for my own clarification. Right. So the front end in many cases, I'd say 90% of cases of companies who say they do social CRM, right. is they have a few people who kind of sit there with a tool, like an engagement platform, and uh, you know, listen to you know, people who are having, you know, complaining about the product, and then going out there and say, gee, I'm sorry you're really having that problem, let's take this offline. Or you know, in many cases, you know, those are unresolved issues. So like, that's what, really what it is. I mean, I think that the Comcast stuff, which was you know, well known for their customer service, they had like nine people who were basically call, you know, call center folks, communications folks, who were just kind of put into a system to do that. So it's very primitive right now. But that's not where it's going. I mean, right. where, the, where it's going is this is going to be the lifeblood of many organizations. And this intelligence is going to touch not just customer care, but research and development, and crisis, and PR, and all these other parts of the organization, lead gen, et cetera. Here's the so, 10 more years, huh? <laughs> yeah, if I last that long, so yeah. <laughs> who's, who's using data to effectively measure, to, like who, who honestly believes today they're using data to effectively measure what they've got going on in, in, in their organization, with, with social specifically? If, everyone, if anyone's boss is beside so, them, they have to put their hand up, that's okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> One of the things that we, we see is, a lot of people who are searching for, you know, connecting all of the data together to date is still a bit of a chase for a magical unicorn through, you know, Disney World. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily exist in the technology, to Rob's point, of it being early stages there. One of the things that is the keys to success, the point where we're at in the market today with, with social data is understanding what the organization is trying to achieve, trying to measure something in the most simplistic way humanly possible and then executing flawlessly against it because you're going to be driving more ROI from that than you may be spending another year or two to go a layer or two down because the organization isn't doing a great job of the early stuff that, with the information versus a lot of the information that's going to come from another you know, two years of data ingestion and processing because there still is an operational challenge that exists for a lot of companies today. But let me, let me just paint something really quickly as an example of a company who was in the CC the other day, a big data uh, products company, and their vision is let's take this real-time conversation and when somebody's saying, gee, I'm thinking about buying a car, that they're able to pump that data into their system, append all that, in, all that data with all the other data that they know about who this particular person is and then churn out an email to them and say, you know, uh, free test drives, you know, in your, right. lar in your area. So let's get past the creepiness factor for a second, but that's where it's going. So the social intelligence stuff is going to be an enabler for a bunch of uh, applications that are built on top of it over time. Because uh, if you have all the conversation and you have the sentiment and the topics and all this other vast amount of intelligence, imagine what you imagine the tools that will be built on that, for the, both for the enterprise but also in terms of data products. Yeah, I mean the creepiness factor is definitely something that I've never personally cared about. As long as uh, someone doesn't steal my credit card information and start charging things, like I know I'm being watched. I know people can you know gather lots of data. Uh, personally, you know, running a business, I'm looking forward to this data in order to uh, better serve everyone, better ads that are more appropriate for you, uh, you know, across the board. 
And, and I think you know, that, that appropriateness is that creepiness factor. And I think people are going to be creeped out by it. You know, the, the government's watching them, yada, yada, yada. Um, but how far away, realistically, do, you, do we think we are from these uh, large enterprises? Uh, you know, I think, uh, obviously, the creepy factor will be uh, coming in pretty strong with uh, the new iPhone and the new Google Android devices. Um, you know, and it's going to be right in your face. People don't tend to notice it as much when there's an ad targeting of them. They just uh, kind of either ignore the ads. But I mean, how, when, when do we think we're going to really start hitting this creepy factor? I think, I think it's a, a, I guess that's a regional question and that's a demographic question. Let's, let's, talk, about the, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the US specifically. I think we're the most afraid of it because we haven't really experienced it just yet as much, uh, visibly at least. I think, I think we know. It's a, it's a curve. I think we've hit it for some people you know, a while ago. Um, when you, like, they know it's my own email coming to my own screen. Um, <laughs> how do they do that? Um, but I, I think over the next few years, a lot of those things are going to be really you know, tested. I think we're, we're, in, we're moving from a, a world of local privacy you know, to a world really of global privacy. And we're seeing mass change happening as a result of all the things that are going on as well. So but do you see the companies that you're working with uh, as your clients really looking for this data in order to do those kinds of things? I think, I think it's going to come. Like, we work with some of the largest financial institutions in the world and, you know, who, who are as sensitive about privacy as we are. Um, they, you know, are they really, though? No, they really, like, in terms of this stuff, absolutely. Right. I think there, there's taking, there has to be, a, there has to be a, um, a reason to do a lot of these things. And there are obviously a lot of the reasons. But it comes down to the point where, are, you gotta, one, are you doing the basics well? You know, doing that, then you're going to require and get more and more and more and more targeted. A lot of the organizations say are still working on doing the basics really well, and as they start to do that, they're going to add the layers of targeting and you know, right. um, optimized content and all of those things. But the large enterprises are still getting to that point to require some of those demands. At kind of a mass overarching statement. But that that transactional level, what we're talking about, is still just a portion of right. what the value that accrues to an organization. I mean. With this type of data, you know, we're testing things like in the automotive industry to be able to do predictive modeling on car sales based on conversation. And so think about the impact that has on supply chain and everything else in terms of kind of what you create. So, um, so I, mean, this, I mean, this stuff is big, but, and that's why I would say um, you know, that, that we think the next three to five years in this space um, is we're going to see developments and uh, breakthroughs and uh, and uh, that, that we can't even really expect right now because the, even the big data, the big, because we're still all trying to deal with big back-end technologies like Hadoop and others just to be able to manage this data, right? And then, then find the insight and the anomaly. And then how do you, and then there's also the challenge of you often find what, what you're looking for. If I'm just looking for this stuff, that's all I'm going to find. What about the white space? What about the, what about the anomalies in the conversation? Right. How do you find that as well? And so these are all challenges that we're working through, but there are organizations, and I'll put IBM out there as one, who, um, we, as it, we've, been, we've been fortunate enough to work closely with them over time, who really have this vision of you know, not just a smarter planet, but becoming a smarter company, where this analytics and this intelligence is going to all 400,000 employees and being able to act uh, you know, as, as, uh, as a coherent organization around it. And, and let's talk about the, you know, the enterprise, and I mean, affecting you know, supply chains across the world. Uh, you know, and how, how close are we to really start figuring this out? Obviously, it's gotten easier over time. Uh, you've been in business for several years now. You've been in business for 10 years now. Um, are, are we hitting the point where we're finally going to be making uh, your lives and the data a lot um, better, really, in general, to, to make these decisions, to really start uh, being able to predict trends and being able to see the trends uh, in general, even as they're happening? Yeah. I mean, are, are, we, are we getting there? Uh, are, is it, are we, you know, what's, what's really happening right now? All right. Well, there are two layers of intelligence into this. And uh, I didn't think we'd be talking about supply chains at a social yeah. media conference. <laughs> for sake. But there's a couple layers of data. There are things that the machines can do pretty well, right? And so they, it can tame a lot of the data. It can clean out spam. It can get to relevant conversation. It can get to topic. It can do an OK with sentiment analysis. But the, the truth is, you still need to have humans involved in the data at a certain point to be able to find the insights. There's a great Henry, or, uh, Henry Ford quote uh, who you said, you know, if I had listened to my customers, they would have told me they wanted faster horses, right? And the truth is, how do you, want, at a certain level, um, you, we actually have teams of cultural anthropologists and sociologists and others who are looking at the data to just not find the explicit conversation, the explicit data. What's the implicit meaning, and how do you find connections, and how do you find those 
insights that can change a business. Yeah. That's an art and not just a science. So all the, all the technology can do is to try to make that stuff easier. But humans have to still be involved in the process. Yeah, I know that about both of your companies too. I think that's one of the most interesting things is that you guys uh, obviously rely on technologies to do a lot of the mining across the board, but both of your companies rely heavily on humans to actually understand those technologies. And, th and that's one of the things, that your, your human point that's really important is the cost benefit analysis. You know, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing is automating you know, through machine what most people want and then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. The question is virtually anything is possible, it's really at what cost. So is understanding that insight of 20 or 50 or 100 people, is that worth a, you know, a lot of physical you know, eyes on the screen and hands on the keyboard to get to it? And the question is gonna depend on what vertically you're in, what your margins are, 10,000 questions. So ultimately, there's a difference between what we can tell from the data if there is no boundaries of cost and what are we gonna be able to, how are we gonna be able to use data for the average enterprise you know, that's large, medium, and you know, obviously smaller businesses as well. And those are all kind of different questions that each pose different problems. Got it. Um, all right, we've got a couple minutes left. Thankfully, I, I, I'm the run of show guy, so I can go over if I wanted to. Um, all right, so I, th I think uh, I'll just ask one more question and uh, open it up for quick questions. But I think uh, my, my really quick question and try to have a Twitter-like answer is, you know, obviously you work with massive enterprises, and I'm not trying to simplify this at all, but if you were to try to simplify it, what is the one biggest uh, ask uh, when you have a big enterprise client coming to you for the first time to try to solve? What are, what are they really looking to figure out these days when they're approaching either one of your companies? Well, I, I, still, I still think there's an inclination that this social thing is kind of, you know, important, but they're not quite sure where, and I think that Many of the folks that we end up working with is maybe they've tried a lot of kind of different things, experimentation, but now they're saying, how do we as an organization have a systematic approach to social that allows us to scale this across the enterprise to meet all those use cases internally, to, to align to key performance indicators that the C-suite cares about, and, but also within that framework to allow the flexibility to be able to do the creative execution and allow us to be humans within that environment. So it's not just, you know, it's technically some of this stuff can be easy, although a lot of the stuff we're talking about isn't, you know, but culturally it can be really hard. So yeah. we're helping to address, you know, I think one of the big things, and a lot of big brands would say here, you know, the big issue, there are all these cross currents. You know, there's very little coherence to uh, what a lot of these efforts are. I mean, a lot of people describe social in different ways or different parts of the elephant. So um, that's where we tend to come in. I think that's what the big ask is, how do we do this at, how do we do this at scale? I, I like that phrase, there are different parts of the elephant. Never heard of that one before, I love it. Yeah, all right. Um, I, I would summarize it in terms of sol solve social complexity and allow our organization to execute. That's, and I'm gonna end it there and not go into a lot more detail around it. Thank, thanks for the Twitter code there. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, questions. I see some Questions, no, just brushing your hair, just, just, oh, there we go, yep, thank you, yeah, please, uh, please use the mic. And I can't really see you, so once you just get there, feel free to start talking. <laughs> Is there a mic there? Yeah, there we go. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Oh, it's portable, nice. Yep, um, Matthew Dooley here from uh, American Modern Insurance Group in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I recently formed a social media team at my organization, and uh, I have my own way of going about it, but I was curious if you Either of you could provide your thoughts on uh, both forming a team and then who are the right players, what kind of structure do you put in place, and then also uh, keeping them engaged and informed, uh, educated, et cetera. Right. Uh, well, I think right, that's I'll, a good, I guess good I'll, I'll kick that off. I mean, look, I think that the model of creating a, a task force around social or social media center of excellence or whatever is works for a lot of organizations. Um, the, the folks who obviously, it's really interesting to me when we come with a big company and the first time that we set that up, they're sitting around the table and you know, compliance is there and legal. We have to deal with the lawyers as much as we hate to do that. PR, uh, you know, analytics, et cetera. And oftentimes they're, in, they're introducing themselves to each other for the first time. So it's really interesting to me, first of all, that the socials become this glue for parts of the organization to talk together for the first time that they never had before. But for it to succeed, there are two things that I think have to happen. You need a sponsor within the organization at a more senior level to be able to kind of give air cover for this thing to work. And then you need kind of the day-to-day -day folks who are going to actually drive this thing forward. But this is about change management as much as having all those people involved. If they're not brought to the table or given the opportunity to, you have this not invented here syndrome that often happens. 
And we'll often say, you know, businesses don't change, people change, and when enough people change, businesses change. And so you do need that representation, and, um, but you also need, um, it often, it's often critically important that before you start to go forth, that you understand exactly where you are today. So, you know, measure yourself against all those enablement things that you need to have to be a social business and figure out are you a leader or a laggard or where do you happen to be versus your competition, et cetera. That brings a level of objectivity to the process that instead of having a bunch of opinions around the table, um, and also understand where you are in the external conversation. So in the insurance industry, I have 3% of the conversation and 62% positive is about these products. But then you have, you have a benchmark to work against. We want to increase our conversation by 10% and our sentiment by X and this, et cetera, et cetera. It starts to lead to conclusions that people can't really argue with, you know, that it starts to kind of drive you in a direction that, uh, or else you find yourself reinventing yourself every, every 30 days, you get back together and you have the same conversation you did the previous 30 days. So you need roadmaps, you need, you need frameworks, you need timelines, you need all of those things together. But what you did is a great first step. I, I agree with Rob. I think the one thing I'd add is the, the things that make those teams often be very successful is um, being able to run down, ride down the middle between communicating too much, um, but not, communi you know, not kind of being intrinsic and getting things done. The most successful teams that we've seen in the early stages when you're starting from nothing is a team that's you know, really working closely together, that's just getting things done almost at all costs. It has that senior sponsor, but they're generally very good presenters. They're presenting the business cases, and they're not talking about things in um, lofty statements. We're not making kind of lofty, there are all the things we can do, and you know, it's social, it's changing, all these things. It's like, this is, this is the social, here's our objective, here's what we're gonna do, here's how, how, much, here's how we're gonna do it, here's how much money it's gonna cost, here's when, when we're gonna have it done. Can we do this, yes or no? Yeah. Well, we wanna talk about it. Yes or no? Yes. Great. Let's go. Um, so I, I think thinking about how you're going, you know, what, what, which, which wins you want and being very focused on them can make a very big difference in being successful. Yeah. I just add real quickly to that because it's a great point is, you know, don't boil the ocean. We often say the great thing to do is go to the C-suite, go to your CMO and say, what keeps you up at night? Give me two things that keep you up at night and let's figure out how we're going to actually solve that as an issue. And once you do that momentum within the organization, the doors open up. So, you know, focus on those things first. Okay. All right. Thank awesome. You. Hopefully it's not unicorns uh, running through Disney, uh, Disney World. <laughs> That's They're a problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Rob and Michael, very much. Um, sit out here while I give some uh, final house notes. But uh, thank you, guys. Uh, it was definitely a, a lot of fun, and I'm sure we can talk forever on this. But uh, unfortunately, time is out. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Adam.